on the West Country tonight. They're queuing round the block as panic buying sets in across the region. I am surprised, yes, that people generally are panic. Well, I'm panicking the same as anybody else, so I suppose I can't blame them. Police say irresponsible motorists are to blame as they shut petrol stations. Also on the programme tonight, the new CCTV footage, which could give a major clue in the Annie Dewani murder case. No new nuclear power station at Oldbury, as the companies planning to build one pull out. A life reborn after this man's wife gives him one of her kidneys. I'm a very lucky man. Very, very lucky. And a hundred years on, remembering one of the West Country's most famous explorers, Scott of the Antarctic. This is the West Country Tonight with Vanessa Cuddeford and Bob Cruz. Good evening. Many of our petrol stations came to a standstill today as panic buying gripped the southwest. Queues were reported across the region as fears about a tanker strike grew. Dorset police blamed irresponsible motorists as they shut petrol stations and firefighters in Gloucestershire condemned the government's advice to store fuel at home. Richard Payne reports on the panic at the pumps. Queues, queues and more queues. There is no fuel shortage, not even a date for strike action. But there is panic buying. This was mid-morning in a usually quiet suburb of Bristol, made busier because down the road they'd already run out. I'm panicking the same as anybody else, so I suppose I can't blame them. And I'm not surprised then. I was told it was very busy and I thought I'd better get it in now. <laughs> I think because Mr Cameron has told everyone to top up their petrol tank, so everybody is. Yes, as here in Bath, it felt like every driver was rushing to the forecourt following government advice to top up. Advice they repeated today. The impacts of a tanker strike could, could be very, very severe for our economy, could really disrupt the lives of millions of, of people. So we are advising people to keep their fuel tanks topped up. But as they queued around the block in Gloucestershire, one minister's call for drivers to store a 20-litre jerry can of petrol in readiness for any strike was speedily withdrawn and condemned by fire service leaders. Unless you're doing it in line with legislation uh, and within the right areas, then you shouldn't be doing it. All emergency services are keeping a close watch on developments with reserve supplies being monitored. In the event of uh, a fuel strike or, or any significant disruption, uh, we have emergency uh, fuel supplies which we hold uh, across our operational area. Um, and it's very much a case of business as usual, even in the event of a, a fuel strike. In Dorset, police advised some petrol stations to temporarily close as congestion built up on surrounding roads. Officers blamed irresponsible motorists for endangering other road users. But some were smiling. One garage owner told me he'd taken a record £41,000 in just 24 hours. It's better than Christmas, he said. Smiles on the faces of motorists, however, are yet again harder to find. Richard Payne for the West Country tonight. And for more on the fuel shortages and the rest of the day's news, you can go to our New Look website. You'll find all the latest news, sport and weather at itv.com forward slash west. Next tonight, new CCTV footage has emerged which could provide clues to the Annie Dewani murder case. She was shot dead on her honeymoon in South Africa last year. The previously unseen pictures allegedly show her husband Shreen giving money to a taxi driver for arranging her murder. He denies any involvement in her death. Tomorrow, a court will rule whether he has to go to South Africa to face trial. Cordelia Lynch reports. Cape Town, South Africa. It's Saturday night on the 13th of November 2010, the night Annie Dewani is murdered. Her husband, Bristol businessman Shreen Dewani, waits for her outside their hotel room. Soon after, we see them together. Less than six hours later, she's shot dead. It's alleged by the South African authorities that he ordered it. 
These CCTV images obtained by a TV documentary crew show a side to the couple not made public until now. In the bar, they pose and smile for photos. They're tactile. Days after her murder, Mr. Dwani is seen returning to the hotel. Taxi driver Zola Tongo, who has been convicted for his part in the killing, is close behind. He claims Mr. Dwani handed him money for arranging the murder. But Shreen Dwani says he owed the driver for his services as a tour guide. He has always strenuously denied any involvement in his wife's murder. Annie's cousin and friend, Sneha Hindocha, claims the couple were having problems in their relationship. She told the West Country tonight that Annie had tried to call off the wedding days before and threw her engagement ring at her fiancé. Mr Dwani's lawyers say he is innocent and is determined to return to South Africa to clear his name and seek justice for his wife Annie when he fully recovers and his personal safety can be guaranteed. The care home owner remains sectioned under the Mental Health Act. He is said to be suffering from depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. He is currently being treated here at Froomside Secure Hospital in Bristol, but his future will be decided tomorrow in London at the High Court. Well, we seem to have uh, some sort of uh, difficulties here with our power. Seems to be in a power cut, <laughs> which has taken us right, uh, right off air. But we'll try and bring you some more of the day's news now. Yes. Let us go to our next story. And uh, four companies, including one part German firm, are bidding for the Great Western Rail franchise. A 15-year contract to run trains throughout the West Country will be awarded from next year. As well as the current operator, First Group, the other bidders are National Express, Stagecoach and a consortium made up of Arriva trains and Deutsche Bahn from Germany. A canal lock in Bath has a new pair of nine-tonne gates. The handcrafted oak gates were swung into position near Pulteney Bridge this morning. They should last 25 years. It's part of a three-week repair project costing £270,000. At 19 feet deep, the lock is the deepest on the Kennet and Avon Canal and is the second deepest in the country. Apologies that we're not able to bring you any pictures for these stories. We will try to do so as soon as we can. Uh, Animals at Bristol Zoo have had some famous faces helping them out this week. Uh, Bristol Rugby's players may be fighting for promotion back to the Premiership, but they've been given, uh, they've been at Bristol Zoo, as I said, enjoying the sunshine and giving the zookeepers a hand. They face Nottingham at the Memorial Stadium tomorrow night. Just give you a reminder of our top story tonight, and uh, many of our petrol stations have come to a standstill today. Many of you may have noticed this while you've been out and about on the road today. As panic buying has gripped the nation, queues have been reported right across the West and the West Country over fears of a tanker strike. There hasn't been a strike announced yet, but the fears of that potential strike have led people to start buying petrol. Uh, and these uh, firefighters in Gloucestershire uh, condemned the government's advice, which uh, you may have heard yesterday, for people to start uh, stockpiling fuel in jerry cans in their garages at home. Assuming that we can get the pictures to you, which the technical team are trying to sort out at the moment, there is still plenty more to come before half past six, including a story uh, about Captain Scott, Scott of the Antarctic's last words, letters that he wrote, some of them previously unseen. It is, of course, the centenary of his death, and there's a special programme on ITV1 tomorrow night, but we'll be previewing it a little bit later in the programme.
fascinating stuff too as well. Yeah. I mean, having a look at some of those letters that he wrote and some of the entries in his diary right at the, uh, at the end of his, uh, his life were really quite interesting to read. We can now bring in our political correspondent, Bob Constantine, who is... Ah, uh, oh, no, I, I'm hearing now that we've actually got some pictures back to you. <laughs> so let's go back to one of the stories that we were going to mention a little yeah. bit earlier in the programme. There it is. Uh, and plans for a new nuclear power station at Oldbury in Gloucestershire have been scrapped. The two companies hoping to build it have pulled out. Yes, Eon and N Power blame rising costs and the economic downturn. Uh, the decision was welcomed by environmental campaigners uh, and Bob Constantine, our political uh, correspondent, joins us. Bob, just tell us a bit about uh, what has happened here in this story today. Well, uh, you may remember the two companies, which have both happened to be German-owned, uh, NPower and Eon, two big nuclear energy companies, bought some land, one of two sites, in fact, identified by the government for nuclear power in the West Country, the other being, of course, at Hinkley Point. They bought the land, but today they announced that actually they didn't feel they could any longer afford to build a nuclear power station there. There are very long-term costs, of course, involved in nuclear power these days. Um, the builders have to cover the decommissioning costs of nuclear power as well, which could um, go years, decades into the future. And also they've been affected by the not just the worldwide downturn, the economic downturn, but also uh, the phasing out of nuclear power in Germany. Is there any embarrassment? I mean, this was supposed to be one of the, the future of, of power for, for the UK, wasn't it? Well, it certainly caught the government a bit on the hop because the government is obviously relying largely on nuclear power to plug an impending energy cap. Clearly, renewals, um, renewable energy like tidal power and wind power will not be able to fulfil all our energy requirements, particularly here in the southwest in years to come. So they were looking to nuclear energy to plug that gap. Now, of course, this big hole has opened up in their strategy Theoretically, uh, Horizon, which is the, the, the joint venture company that they set up to do this, is up for sale. Other nuclear companies from around the world will be looking, will be eyeing it up. But clearly there are a lot of upfront costs, there are a lot of um, long-term costs before you even start to turn a profit. Uh, this was something that wasn't due to come on stream till about 2025, so it's long-term. But clearly they're back to the drawing board on this. Um, and what, what are the chances, perhaps, Bob, of someone else stepping in to take over the well, site? I, uh, the, the government will obviously be hoping there can be a quick and speedy sale to pipe somebody like EDF, the company behind Hinkley Sea uh, on the Somerset coast. Um, I think you have to say it's pretty uncertain at the moment. The whole energy market has been thrown into flux by this by this decision in Germany to, to phase out nuclear power there um, and the long-term prospects are still quite uncertain. I think we may be looking at, 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 at the possibility of um, some sort of government stimulus being brought into play um, because uh, without some sort of government support energy companies seem to be saying they don't believe they can make enough money get a quick enough return. What about local reaction around Oldbury? I imagine there was, there was some, a, a deal of some sort of uh, a campaign against it, the same way we've seen at Hinkley Point. Uh, what are campaigners well, saying I, I think, if anything, it was actually more vociferous than, it's, than, than at Hinkley Point. It was quite a well-organised campaign, supported by the local MP, who complained that large cooling towers were going to appear on the riverbank there. Um, so that's obviously been welcomed by local environmental groups tonight. As I say, I think the problem now is with the government. Where do they go from here in terms of offering some sort of incentives to other nuclear companies to step into the market? OK, Bob Constantine for the moment. Thank you very much for joining us in the studio. We're still having our problems, as you can probably tell. Just to remind you that uh, there's plenty of news on our website. If you want to go on to there, go to itv.com forward slash news and then click on your region. One of the stories on there, you may remember last night if you were watching, we covered the story about a couple, uh, the gentleman needed a kidney and his wife donated it to him. The second part of that story we were due to bring you tonight, that's on our website if you want to have a little look at that. itv.com forward slash news and then click on your region. A reminder of our top story tonight, uh, petrol stations across the region have come to a standstill today as panic buying gripped the region. Uh, queues were reported across the west over fears of a tanker strike. Uh, we can see some live pictures now I'm hearing showing motorists trying to fill up in Bristol. Dorset police have also blamed irresponsible motorists as they shut petrol stations and firefighters in Gloucestershire condemned the government's advice for people to store fuel at home. There will be plenty more of that story on the national news, which is coming up at half past six. For the moment though, in a few minutes time, we're actually gonna to cross to our Meridian region and to their news programme.
because they're not suffering the same problems that well, we, we are and tonight. Sort out what we've got here, we've got um, some some major problems with uh, with power here in the studio, and uh, a power cut seems to have taken us knocked all the systems right out. So we're having a few problems. We're going to uh, let you cross over to uh, the ITV Meridian region and see what's on their program tonight. 15 minutes past six, you're watching Meridian tonight. Thank you, as always, for your company. Time now for a quick look at what's making the headlines on the ITV National News. To London, Mary Nightingale. Coming up, we'll have the very latest on the fuel crisis from right around the country as ministers are accused of fueling the petrol panic. And the story of the elephant who packed her trunk and really ran away from the circus. Found out why with James Mates and me at 6.30. Well, more now in our series to mark the 100th anniversary of the sinking of the Titanic. And you might find this slightly surprising, but cruise ship companies are hoping the publicity will stimulate new interest in transatlantic travel. Of course, many things have changed in ocean travel since the Titanic hit an iceberg. Not least the comfort that not just the privileged rich, but all passengers can now enjoy. Well, our transport correspondent, Mike Pierce, has been given exclusive access to one of the most luxurious liners of them all, the Queen Mary II, to find out exactly what travellers might expect today. Today, this is the only ship still making regular crossings from Southampton to New York. Queen Mary II was in fact built after an upsurge in interest following James Cameron's epic film, relaunched in 3D this week. We're making the final crossing before the 100th anniversary. Many on board say they want to relive the glory days of travel. I wouldn't have known such glamour existed. And to find out you can recapture something nearly 100 years old, and this does it. They did probably similar things to us had wonderful dinners and had beautiful ships. With all there is to do aboard a Cunarder, it's no wonder travellers agree that getting there is half the fun. One of the biggest changes over the last 100 years has been to the class system on board. Of course, in the days of the Titanic, there were three classes. That continued to QE2 when there were two classes in the 1960s, and that stayed right through to 1994. Today, that's virtually all disappeared. Some in this group made their first journey on a ship 80 years ago. They remember the class system and cabins where four people shared. We were in tourist class and we were in bunk beds, you know, which is not heard of nowadays. They put me on the top bunk and that was it. There was no comfort there. Get on the beds, quickly. Go. There were ropes across, do not enter. Uh, I can remember all that. I'm sorry, sir, third class passengers only pass this point. The first and second class could not mingle with the traveling third class because the U.S. had to inspect the immigrants when they came into Ellis Islands or whatever the point of entry was. And if they, uh, they looked for four major diseases, and if they had them, they just wouldn't accept them. They were sent back. For entertainment, some things haven't changed, like gentlemen host to dance with the ladies. It's got the best dance floor, the most dancing ladies. And you get to dance with them as well? That's not only get to, I'm required to and love to. When it's time for tea, you may enjoy it wherever you happen to be. Another tradition intact, afternoon tea at three. Cunard Hope continuing publicity about the Titanic will help boost passenger numbers. That's also good for the hundreds of people from the south employed on its ships. I grew up in Southampton and I used to see these ships coming in and out and I always thought that one day I'd be on one of those ships working, but I never really thought that I'd actually be in command. The end of a journey Titanic never saw, but for many it's a unique experience they're pleased to be part of. Mike Pierce in New York for Meridian Tonight. Absolutely fascinating. Well, from New York to Northern Ireland, here's Mike Pierce again in the city where Titanic was built. 
Well, tonight, the finishing touch is being put on Titanic Belfast. This is the biggest, and at a cost of more than £100 million, the most expensive tribute to Titanic ever built anywhere in the world. It charts the story right from the building of the ship here in Belfast to a departure from Southampton and the sinking at sea. Well, ITV's Julian Fellows, of course, the writer of Downton Abbey and the new Titanic drama, was here earlier for his own preview. It's a real destination point. It's something, if you're interested in the Titanic at last, there's somewhere to go here now and to see it and to learn about it and to uh, have a sense of what involved, uh, you know, what was involved in building a ship of this scale. They say this is a visitor experience and not a museum. But how then does it compare with Southampton's new Sea City Museum, also devoted in part to the Titanic? Join me for a tour on tomorrow's programme at six. Mike Pierce reporting there from Belfast and we'd like to say good evening to our viewers watching in the West and West Country region. You've got us due to a technical problem but we hope you're enjoying We're this We're going international aren't we? I know we really are. Hello <laughs> Vanessa and Ian, sorry that you're watching us. Hello. <laughs> Now, it's also 100 years since Captain Scott and his team perished on their expedition in the Antarctic. Indeed, today a service of commemoration has been held at St Paul's Cathedral in London to pay tribute to their courage and fortitude. Well, it's a day of immense pride, of course, but also tinged with sadness because, you know, it was, it's 100 years since my great uncle died. So, but great pride in, in, in the, with the extraordinary courage uh, and, of course, they left a remarkable record behind them and, and had an extraordinary influence over the you know, 20th century science and cultures. Brave man indeed. Well, let's now get to bang up to date. And a certain sporting event is just 120 days away. Won't have escaped you, will it? One of Britain's most successful Paralympians is world cycling gold medalist Darren Kenny, who is looking to make it a golden journey from his home in the New Forest to London later this year. Yes, as Juliet Fletcher now reports, the ancient woodland is the perfect training ground to build up the strength and endurance he needs to succeed. Something is stirring deep in the forest. A patch of colour, moving at pace. But not so much as to disturb the peace of local inhabitants. The cyclist putting in the miles is Darren Kenny, a common sight on the roads around his Dorset home. One of Britain's most successful Paralympians, he's trying not to be distracted by the build-up to London 2012. There aren't any shortcuts or anything like that. Um... I tend to try to distance myself from the enormity of the event, I suppose. Six times Paralympic champion, more than a dozen World Cup golds, world records across numerous disciplines. It was while competing as a teenager, Darren was involved in the cycling accident that left him with brain and spinal injuries. I produce barely any power with my left leg. Um, I don't have full control. When I'm on a bike, obviously, my limbs are attached, if you like. My feet are clipped to the pedals and my hands are gripping the bars, so I can't really go very many places, but um, I have uh, difficulty balancing compared to before. Uh, and obviously, I'm producing power only on one side, mainly, and control fine motor movement as well, so things like braking and changing gear, um, but mainly steering. <laughs> Last month, he helped steer Team GB to 17 medals at the Paracycling Track World Championships in Los Angeles, including one gold and two silvers of his own. With London 2012 looming, there's little doubt about the direction he intends to go. Juliet Fletcher for Meridian Tonight. And more success for Southampton diver Peter Waterfield. He won a silver medal in the 10-metre synchro with Tom Daly at the FINA World Series Beijing and bronze in the individual. The 31-year-old believes Britain could win gold this summer, but it would help if the Chinese slip up. 
Well done, Pete. Next week, we'll be catching up with Kent athlete Martin Brockman. Now, he's training not just for one event, but ten. The 24-year-old is hoping to secure a place in the decathlon at London 2012. He's already exceeded expectations by winning a bronze medal at the 2010 Commonwealth Games in Delhi and has recently returned from training in Australia. But now, with just weeks to go until the qualifiers, he's turning up the heat in his training. And that's next week. Now, it might not exactly be a magical mystery tour, but apparently a sightseeing trip around the M25 does have its moments. Yes, the M25 orbital, known, of course, as Britain's largest car park. It takes in six counties and conjures up images of endless traffic jams, roadworks and variable speed limits. Not most people's idea of a fun day out. But you might just be pleasantly surprised, or then again, you might not. Charlotte Wilkins joined passengers on a trip from Brighton to find out for herself. For some, it's the road to hell, but for others, it seems it's an experience not to be missed. These people have actually parted with £15 each for the privilege of spending the next few hours driving around the M25. I haven't been able to sleep at night thinking, well, I've never been around the M25, I've got to do it. I'm an ex-lorry driver and I used to use the M25. Now I'm retired, I thought, well, yes, when I see it advertised, I'd enjoy it, I'd go all the way around it. And I had to persuade my wife. It just sounded horrendous sitting on a coach going round and round a motorway. They've decided to take the M25 orbital tour, organised by Brighton and Hove buses. The 117-mile trip around Britain's most hated motorway allows passengers to take in all the... uh sights? You look at the telly reports and you'll see accidents, hold-ups, congestion. Well, hopefully we'll be able to point out a few things you can look at next time you're stuck in one of those traffic queues. But before you mock it, it seems there are plenty of people who'd like to experience life in a slow lane. All trips are sold out. Well, that's it. I've officially completed the M25 tour. I've been all the way around without so much as a traffic jam. And the icing on the cake is this certificate to prove that I've done it. Charlotte Wilkins on the M25, Fort Meridian tonight. Hmm, not sure I get it. <laughs> Time for the weather now. Here's Simon. Yes, it's been a lovely day and the lovely weather is causing problems, as it always does. Blame the weather if something goes wrong. Whole Park Gardens in Rolvenden. Have a look at these pictures. These are the lovely flowers and plants Ooh. that they normally expect at this time of year, but they've all popped up early. Yes. So this year they're going to open their doors a week early right. just so that the flowers don't go to waste. They're particularly pleased with their magnolias, bluebells and their rhododendrons. Of course, you expect to find flowers growing there, but we've been looking for flowers growing in strange places. Have a look at this. Uh, this one was Chris Sturgis spotted that's a holly bush <laughs> growing out of a tree. Here is uh, at the Ellen Terry Museum at Smallhithe Place. Uh, that we think is cow parsley growing out of a tree. And Christine Bird in Tunbridge has got one of those growing out of the brickwork. I think it might be a cabbage, but that's my favourite look. A poppy look growing out of Lisa Johnson's Etchings Well Wall. So any more, Meridian Weather at ITV.com. And here he is, the UK's top Met man, Simon Perky Parkin. We can't guarantee you a sunny day, but we could help you find the right tradesperson. Checkatrade.com sponsors Meridian Weather. Check a trade, checkatrade.com. Well, it has been exceptionally warm this last few days. Nowhere quite as hot, though, as John's Garden in Emsworth. Look, one afternoon, 42 Celsius. That's 108 in Fahrenheit. But um, it is going to cool down as we head into the weekend. For tonight, it won't be as cold as it has been. There will just be a touch of frost, but temperatures will pretty much stay above freezing everywhere. Generally clear skies, some patchy cloud by tomorrow morning. But that should burn away fairly quickly because, again, we'll see plenty of warm sunshine. Temperatures through the afternoon peaking 
at around 21, 22, that's 72 in Fahrenheit. So another lovely day. But then through tomorrow night, we are going to see lots of cloud increasing courtesy of this weather front. That's still going to be with us on Saturday. And that means Saturday is going to be a generally quite gloomy day. It's cleared off by Sunday, so things will be a little brighter. But everywhere will be noticeably cooler temperature wise on Saturday. Look, a peak of just 14 degrees by Sunday. Uh, we're down to around 13. And then as we move into the new week, we start off dry on Monday, but a threat of rain on Tuesday. Check a trade, check a trade dot com. All good things, as they say. And some sad news just before we go this evening. Alice Watkins from Great Chart in Kent, and one of our most loyal viewers, has died sadly at the age of 108. And commiserations to her family. That's it. Thanks for your company. To all our viewers all around the world. Wherever you are. <laughs> now the ITV National News. Take good care of yourselves. See you Bye -bye. later. Fueling the petrol panic, the government is accused of causing a rush to the pumps. Motorists queue across the country as demand nearly doubles and ministers change their advice yet again. Get a full tank uh, and don't let it go down too, too far. Mr Cameron has told everyone to top up their petrol tanks, so everybody is.